The following podcast contains opinions from paid professionals. The information provided in this podcast is general in nature and is not advice. Gambling is not a financial strategy. For free and confidential support, call 1-800-858-858 or visit gamblinghelponline.org.au. Welcome to episode four, the final episode of this series of Horse Racing 101, a podcast designed to help recreational punters improve. I'm Paul Joyce, and I'm joined by the delightful Kian Dickens. How are you today? I'm good, Joycey. How are you? I'm great. I'm looking forward to this one. This is the mm-hmm. final episode. We've been working towards it. Mm-hmm. Uh, obviously, if people don't know who we are, of course, Paul and Kian, we cover racing in southeast Queensland for Sky. So we spend a lot of time at the races doing form and trying to find winners. And the point of this podcast, of course, was to try and help punters improve and find their own winners down the track. And uh, one way of doing that, of course, is to look for value. And we are going to try and take punters step by step through framing their own markets okay. in episode four. So it's a big challenge, but I think we might be able to get there. Yes, yep. And you're following along because this is something foreign to you as well. Yeah, because I frame a market differently, but I'll talk about that off the back of me fr- your handiwork here. Good. Well, let's get started. So what we've done is an, uh, instead of rating a normal race, so if we rated a race on Saturday at Randwick, which we could have done, mm-hmm. uh, by the time this podcast drops, the race would have been run and won. So a lot of what we're about to talk about would be... Irrelevant. Irrelevant. All right. So what I've done is I've come up with a fantasy race. We've picked five horses mm-hmm. and we're trying to keep everyone... We're trying to play it fair. So we've got... Our Melbourne, probably our best horse in Melbourne, best horse in Sydney, best horse in Queensland. Mm-hmm. Apart from Arch Choice. <laughs> people are going to disagree with this. This, this. this segment isn't about people disagreeing because I'm sure people... It's not will. about the best horse, is it's it? It's not really. It's just, they're just horses that fit into this segment, right? <laughs> we've gone to Perth and, uh, of course, then we've gone overseas, right? Yep. So this is the field for a fantasy race. Now, just for the sake of setting a set of prices, mm-hmm. we're going to pretend we're at Randwick, we're on a good track, and we're running over the mile. You've already got me out of my comfort zone. Yeah, but well, that's all right. It's, you're supposed Can to get out of the zone. No, we're not going to Gatton. <laughs> we're not going to Kilcoy or Gatton. We're going to Randwick, the big mile. And we're going to do it under wait for age conditions. Yep, perfect. Because uh, to handicap these would have been possible, but mm-hmm. would have got very confusing. So we're going to go under wait for age conditions. And we are going to try and price up these five horses, Kian. And the idea of this is to wind the clock all the way back to episode one mm-hmm. when I threw a coin at you, and then we flipped a dice over at you, and then we picked a card out of 52 cards. And what the basis of that was, was just to give you an idea of what probability equals in terms of percentages, which then turns into a market, which is very simple when you've only got a few outcomes, like a dice has got six sides. Yeah. Right? There's only six possible outcomes. When you get to horse racing, the variables explode, uh, but there is still a way to narrow it down and get your percentages, which you'll then use to form a market. And of course, once you've got your market, you just compare it to the actual market and things get pretty easy at that end of it. So... Let's get started. We've got our five horses. You ready to go? Mm-hmm. So we've got Romantic Warrior with James McDonald mm-hmm. carrying 59 kilos. We've got Mr. Brightside with Craig Williams. Who else would ride Mr. Brightside? 59 kilos. We've gone for a Queenslander Antino. Now, this is a big ask for a horse like Antino to step into a weight for age race like this. But he's, he's got something about him, doesn't he? Mm-hmm. So he's in the field. Jimmy Orman gets the ride. Fangirl, Nashra Willa. Of course, she took out the big King Charles. Uh, the inaugural running of that over the mile at Randwick, so I think she's entitled to have a crack. Great style. And uh, Amelia's jewel, our West Australian, well, star. She probably had, didn't have a lot go right yeah. uh, in the most recent campaign, but... Can gallop. She can gallop. Mm. So she gets she gets a jersey as well. All right, Karen, so the first step mm-hmm. in uh, assessing our own prices is to give horses a base rating. Now, we touched on ratings in depth in episode three, and uh, you can access ratings from anywhere. Uh, that They're available for free, Racing Australia, Racing New South Wales, Racing Queensland, most states have their own set of ratings they use to handicap horses, mm-hmm. which we also covered in episode three. But now we're going to use a base rating. Now, a base rating is the rating you give a horse going into its next race. So you've got to anticipate, you've got to forecast the rating you think this horse is about to produce. So to do that, you use a lot of different ways punters do it, but mostly you just go back and look at their previous ratings and you try and work out where they're headed. Are they on an improve? Are they going down? Are they at the flat line? Uh, are they in a race where they're probably going to repeat a rating they've done last start or the start before last start? And a lot of uh, punters will just average out their last three or four starts mm-hmm. and use that as their base rating. So whichever way works, uh, I'll probably put more weight on their last start or more weight on their last two starts. Recent form. And i probably put more weight on 
a rating which is a very similar sort of profile race to mm -hmm. this one. Yeah. So if it was a mile at Randwick on a good track three starts ago, and then they've run on a very wet track, or then they've gone up in distance or whatever, I'd probably go back to more the one that reflects what we're doing today. Yeah. So that's sort of where I get my base rating from. So for this particular example, now we've got Ro Romantic Warrior, she's gonna, he's gonna have a base rating of 78. Mm -hmm. Okay, and these are off my rating. So right. every rating scale is different, mine are my own, and they're one, one kilo equals one point. Yeah. And basically one kilo equals one length as well, which is another thing we'll discuss probably in another series, but yeah. everyone has different ideas on this as well. Uh, Mr. Brightside's a 75, Antino's a 66, Fangirl's a 70, and Amelia's Jewel's a 66. So there's your five horses in the race, they're your base ratings, that's what we start on. Now one thing I will tell you very easy, a real shortcut, is that about what we're about to do, a lot of it doesn't make isn't even necessary. You can almost just go off base ratings and yep. go straight to converting it into a price if you want to. But most uh, models, most punters will then go through and add or subtract uh, for a lot of variables. And for this, you can dead set use 50 variables. Josie. You can use three. Yes. Let's backtrack. Yes. Do you want to explain wait for eight, uh, wait, wait for age conditions? Yeah, wait for age conditions. whoever those who don't know. Yeah, so wait for age conditions. Good, good question. So wait for age conditions as opposed to a handicap. I know you like to get ahead of yourself. Yeah, I do. Wait for age conditions <laughs> is just a, is every horse is given a weight on their age. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't matter how good you are or how good your form is or how much better you are than your rivals, you get weighted on your age. Mm. It's great to find good wait for eight age horses, I think. It is indeed. So as opposed to a handicap where the best horse is given the top weight and the lesser horses are given less weight to try and be competitive, yep. in weight for age racing, if you're not good enough, get out of the kitchen because <laughs> you have to be able to match the best horse in the race yep. because you're not getting any weight relief off them. Yes. Right? So that's why so weight for the age... the conditions we're dealing with. That's what we're, and that is why weight for age racing generally produces the best fields because yes. they are the best horses competing against each other. On a... On, Quite on, an even on, on playing an even field. playing field, depending on your age, of course. If you're a younger horse yeah. or a female horse, you're entitled to get some weight relief, and I think that's fair enough. Yeah. And uh, obviously, the weight for age scale is done by experts. And, and of course, uh, that's how it works. If, let's, let's even backtrack further. Um, female horses are given two kilos less. That's right. So that's why in this scale you'll see that uh, Amelia's Jewel gets a bit of weight relief, as does Fangle, mm -hmm. uh, because of their age, and of course they're both female. Their sex, yeah. Yep. So that's how we get to the uh, weight for age weights. And uh, that's how we're basically looking at this particular race. In a handicap, the highest rated horse would carry more weight than the others and significantly more weight, I would imagine. However, under these conditions, yes, I'm going to let you take the floor. Yeah, so Romantic Warrior looks really well placed under these conditions of weight for age racing, obviously with a higher base rating, which is what we're kicking off with. And then we start to add and subtract our variables. As I said, there's you could do 50 of them if you wanted. And when we're talking about these, we're talking about things like jockey, track, track condition, weight, Speed map, consistency, uh, fitness. Barriers. It, barriers. They're all things that you can look at. And you can look at more and more of them if you want to. Um, personally, I don't get too involved in it. I look at the really basic ones that I think may add or subtract off a base rating. Uh, but I also probably start my base ratings with a lot of that already done in my head. Yeah. So I've already sort of thought about that before I come up with their base rating. So I'm not really thinking about distance so much unless it's a massive jump or come back in distance. Wet tracks, of course, if that kicks in, you've got to add or subtract it. If the horse has got wet track form, we've discussed that in episode three. Uh, so it all comes together here as you try and make up your own prices. But let's say, for an example, we start with our base rating. These are what we call our herbs and spices. You throw everything into the mix, you add, subtract. And then when you get through that, you're going to come up with a, with a new total rating, What's which is... Favorite? Herbs what you and expect for this one. What's my favourite herbs and spices in, in reality or yeah, in this? I've got two. Uh, <laughs> and they just seem to go with everything. Well, you give yours, what are All they? All purpose seasoning and garlic salt. Yeah, see, I, I was going to say well, chicken salt on chips is just a, a gimme. And uh, I'll put pepper on nearly everything. <laughs> That's just so plain. That is, isn't it? What was yours again? Garlic salt and all purpose seasoning. What is all-purpose seasoning? I don't know what it is, but it goes with every, everything as the name states. You can put it on anything. Really? Yeah. I won't have to give that a try. Oh, yeah. You won't look back. Okay. But I'm not much of a chef. It's not one of, not one of my strengths. Actually, you're probably you better, better, you're probably better cook kitchen. than me. That might I be the second thing. I we might have cook. found the second thing you're better than me at. <laughs> cook. So I've given you two in the last two episodes. It's not bad. It's not bad. You should take that and run. I'm funnier than you. Oh, <laughs> we've had this discussion before. <laughs> Depends on the audience, that's for sure. <laughs> I'm not giving you that one. You are funny, but I'm not giving you that one. Uh, that's a, not yet. That's a photo finish. Um, 
Okay, back to the rating. So, Romantic Warrior base rating comes out from 78. Funny enough, if you add or subtract whatever you want in this particular example, it still comes out of 78. Yep. So, whatever I've added yep. and taken away, whether it's you get pluses for having J-Mac on, but you lose a bit because you're coming back to a mile, uh, Romantic Warrior's best form is probably 2,000. So, yes. you know, you add subtract things and you come up with 78. Uh, Mr. Brightside started 75, ended 75. And Tino started 66, ended up 65 a half. So, it was only lost a half point. Fangirl and Amelia's jewel, they both jump. Uh, Fangirl goes from a 70 to a 72, mm -hmm. and that's because of the weight relief she gets. Yep. And Amelia's jewel goes from a 66 to a 69 and a half, again, because mainly of the weight relief that she gets. Okay. Uh, she's getting on 55 and a half. So they do get pushed up uh, because they are getting weight relief off those top weights. And mm -hmm. So you have to include that. I think and the fact that we're, we are over a mile too, so those weights come into play more. They do. So mm -hmm. that's important. You have to have a look at that. So that gives you your final scores, and they're the rating we're expecting this horse to run on this particular race. Uh, looking at those scores, Kian, now we're getting to a little bit of mathematics, but don't get too put off. We're going to get through it. And Romantic Warrior with a 78 is three points ahead of Mr. Brightside, right? So mm -hmm. he, score, he starts off on a zero. Mr. Brightside gets a three because he's three points behind. Antino's 12 and a half points behind Rom Romantic Warrior. Fangirl's six points behind. And Amelia's Jewel's eight and a half points behind. So you just have to basically work out how far behind the toppy they are. And that is their new score going forward to produce a price. So you're with me? I'm with you. Good. Mm. Great. Now, this is where you need a chart which we are going to put up. And it's a chart that you're going to live and die by. Because uh, what we've just come up with there, with that score... Is this chart here? I'm going to show it to you, but we're also going to show everyone at home, right? Mm -hmm. It's a pretty simple chart. Yep. And you just line up the score of our toppy, which was a zero. Mm -hmm. They get a decimal point, a decimal price of one, mm -hmm. right? And as we go down the page, we get a three, gets a decimal price of point four. Four. Yep. Right. The uh, twelve and a half is right off the bottom of the chart, so we're going to give it a point zero one, yep. just so it's got something. We've got a five, goes across to a point oh eight, I think it is. I can't um, quite see it. Or is it 14? no six, sorry. A six goes across to a point oh eight. Yep. And the eight and a half goes to a point oh three. Mm. You got that? So they just go straight down the page. We add them up. So you can add them up, right? Simple. Comes to one point five two. Okay. Now, this is our maths. So now we've got to try and work that out into a percentage. So we are giving each horse a percentage chance of winning this next race. Mm -hmm. Just like our dice, like our cards, like our coin. And this is how the next step. So this is your little bit of maths. It's not hard. We've got our total of 1.52. And we've got an equation here which we're just going to flip over. And I can't find it in front of me, but I've got it somewhere. And basically what you do is you take the top price, which is, we're going to start with a 1 for Romantic Warrior. Mm -hmm. And you divide that by your total, which is 1.52. Right? So mm -hmm. we're going to do this for every horse. And then you multiply it by 100 because we are going to make a market of 100%. Yes. You can make any market percent you want. If you times it by 120, you get a market to 120%. But I'm just doing it to 100 because it's easier. It's better than 201. That's better than 201. <laughs> metres. One, one metre. So <laughs> 1 divided by 1.52 times 100 equals 66%. So the odds of Romantic Warrior winning our fantasy race 66%. is 66%. And as we head down the page, Mr. Brightside, the same equation we use, comes up at 26%. Uh, Antino only comes up at 1%, Fangirl 5%, Amelia's Jewel 2%. So now we are going to use this little graph that we're also, little table, that we're also going to show everyone at home. And it's too small for you to read. It it's is. like my handwriting. It is like your handwriting. And it is just a what simple... What is on said graph? It is, it is a simple <laughs> graph which you, you should absolutely learn off by heart. So this yeah. is just your percentages straight towards. And it, it's really simple, right? Mm -hmm. It's like learning your times tables. So 50%. Uh, Fifty percent is two dollars, right? Yeah. You know that. Yeah, yeah. Right. Don't so that, go any deeper. So that's on. It's there. not my. I won't not go too deep. But thirty-three percent. Thirty-three percent. Three dollars. Yes. Right. So, it just follows down the page. It's nearly a given. It is. So what we've done here, the sixty-six percent for Romantic Warrior mm -hmm. spits out a dollar fifty. Right. Right. So okay. we're saying Romantic Warrior should be a dollar fifty in this fantasy race. We're saying Mr. Brightside, with a 26% chance of winning the race, mm -hmm. equates to $3.90, mm. which in your head you can make sense of. If it was 25%, it would be $4, right? So Correct. it's very close to that. And Tino's only a 1% chance of winning, so he's a $101 pop. 5% uh, chance to Fangirl, which puts her around the $21 mark. And Amelia's Jewel's a 2% chance of winning, so she goes up at around $51. Mm. So there's a 100% market. You've worked it out yourself. You now know what price every horse should be, mm -hmm. according to our figures or my figures. How do we find value from that? What do we compare it to? The actual market, right? The actual market. Which yeah. we don't have, because no. there is no actual market on this no. race. So I made one up. 
Here's something I prepared earlier. Here's something I prepared earlier. So I've made one up. Now, this will be... So the, well, I'm just going to take it through step by step so you get this right because yeah. I, know, I know you're going to get it right. Yeah. So we've got Romantic Warrior. We've assessed a Romantic Warrior $1.50. Mm-hmm. I'm pretending I've made up a market and you can get $2. Okay. So is that a bet? Is that a value? Yeah, it, it is. is. Right? Yeah. Good overs, right? Good overs. We've got three ninety priced up for Mr. Brightside, but you can only get $3.50. Mm-hmm. So just slightly unders. Yeah. We've got Antino priced at 101 but you can only get 41 Unders. Unders. We've got Fangirl priced at 21 you can only get 8 Unders. And we've got Amelia's Jewel at 51 you can get 12 Unders. All right, so that pretend market I just gave you is a 100% market as well. Yeah. So we've done a 100% market. We're betting into a 100% market. The only horse that is glaringly obvious there that offers value is Romantic Warrior. And you're getting even, even money for it. You're getting even money for something you think should be a 66% chance of happening. Mm. So that's value. So go right back to day one, simple coin toss. Where's the value lie in a 50-50? It doesn't lie anywhere because it's $2 each of two. Um, in horse racing... We've got to a stage now where if we think something's a dollar fifty to happen mm-hmm. or a sixty six percent chance of happening and you're getting two dollars, you're getting even money, that's value. Right? Correct. So I'm not saying go out and bet whatever you want to do, but it's just a simple example of finding value in the marketplace. And you are not you're not going in blind. You're not going you've in blind. You've got a system, you've got something in front of you. And and that how is how reliable it is, it's 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 holds a lot of weight in some way. For exactly. Sure. And 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 it just gives you an idea of how you can get something as complex as a as a horse race and still work it out to where you can clearly see where value sits, at least in your eyes. Yeah. And I know you doing your own form who don't use any of this, right? And you've never used any of this, but you still have so much success with what you do. So in your mind, and I'm sure you, I'm sure everyone at home does this themselves. You almost price horses in your head yeah. as you're doing the form anyway. Yeah, this exactly. This is just a way to see it in front of you, right? It's, it's. I don't know if it's like a sixth sense, sixth sense. Um, like that movie. Like the movie, M Night Charlemagne movie, for all of those who are fans of those with the twists. Oh, you love those twists. They're so movies. good, and they always get you. You just don't know what's coming. Obviously, in that one, Bruce Willis was the ghost. Oh, Sixth Wasn't Sense he? was one yeah, of the best. The first time you saw Sixth Sense, it's scary it, it was too. just like, it, it you walked scary. out just thinking that's the best movie of all time. No, and then, I know, and then, but then you go, But then you go back and watch it again and again. Oh, I've watched you know it about I mean? 12 and, times. But then you sort of know what's going to happen. What, mate, that scene where he's under the little fort? Ooh, yeah. Terrifying. All right, where were we? Well, the, the idea without punching all these numbers and figures, you can just, you are, when you get in your rhythm, when you know your horses, you know your area, your hunting ground, and you're having luck and things are going good and your eye is is being reliable, you do mark horses in your head. And it's not on paper, um, but I find um, I can price a horse up, the one I'm really keen on, and I'll know if I'm getting... Uh, Value. If I'm getting bang for my buck, yeah, when those markets open. So that's what I was just touch on quickly before we move on from this. So look, hopefully we've given viewers and punters some idea of how that all works. And I know it can be a bit complex at your first look, uh, but once you do it a couple of times, you can do it on a piece of paper with a pen. You can do it with a spreadsheet, obviously, on a computer a lot easier. Uh, or you can get your own model designed or work on one if you're that good with your computers. But, um, you know, it, it is quite simple once you work it out. An easier way to do it, and it's just on what you touched on. I mean, you can sit there and do your form for a race and basically write down, I think number one's going to win this race, and I think he's going to win it clearly, right? Like, I think he's got a big margin over yeah. the next horse. That next horse might be number three. And then you think, well, he's going to probably run second after I'd looked at this form of for this race. And I think he'll run second quite clearly. And then I've got a big, big gap back to the third horse, which is number five. Yeah. But then from there on, they're all pretty close together. Like yep. five, six, seven, eight. They haven't got much between them. So even though you've, you've just written that down on your form guide, in your head, you've already pretty much worked out your market, right? Because you've yep. got number one a long way in front of number three, a long way in front of the third horse. So even in your mind, you're thinking, well, that, that horse is... 50% chance of winning this race, maybe even more. Mm. So you know then that that horse should be odds on. It should be in the red, right? So you already got that in your mind. I've got this horse around $1.90. The other horse that I think can win, probably 20% chance, 25% chance. So he's probably going to be around $4 in my head. Yeah. And the rest of them, I don't think any of them can win. Mm. One of them will run a place, but they're probably all around $21 or better. Yeah. So you've already priced it in your head without doing any of this. Yeah. And I think that's sort of where you're coming from when you do your form. So I think, too, another example, Joycey, and I made the mistake yesterday at Kilcoy, um, when I sort of 
framed up my market in my head. It was a benchmark race, so very grey, and it was it was two horses that followed the same run behind each other last start at Warwick, Mr. Bros, and the other was Stormtrooper, and very similar runs, both at unsuitable trips, um, albeit one came up with barrier one at Kilcoy, which is gold. And the other um, had drawn out. You had a senior jockey like Les Tilly, and the other had a press. So you got it. You you bring all those things into factor too. However, one was I think six dollars, and the other was twenty six dollars. And I was not influenced, but I thought, well, I have to go for this twenty six dollar one over this one because of A, B, and C. Yeah, I mean, in your head, you're thinking this horse shouldn't be twenty six dollars. I found the I yeah. found the overs. Unfortunately, yeah. the horse that I should have put on top, that I had him for second, eventually gets the right run for barrier one and wins. And, you know, um, the other is a little bit unlucky, slow away, and just gets edged out for third. So you're not even getting that third place dividend. So mm. it's just, it's, it's an example. And it was just a reminder to myself, I should have just went back to my barriers and all those other variables by being influenced by the price. Yeah, for sure. I mean... I think what we're looking at here is, is, is how to identify value uh, and it certainly doesn't mean you're going to back more winners or you're going to win money on the punt or you're going to become a multi-millionaire by following horses, right? That's yeah. not what we're saying at all. Uh, all we're saying is this is a clear way that you can identify value on paper yeah. just as you can identify it in your head when you do the form. Yeah, and, uh, and, and whilst I didn't get right, good areas. Good areas. I mean, the fact, that, the fact that you just said, because I'm just trying to incorporate your language into my everyday life so the fact that the fact that you sort of had a six dollar pick second pick that won the race Mm. and you had a 26 dollar pick that ran a bit of an unlucky fourth Mm. in the same race Mm. um is it fair to say that's a weird flex well no no it's not because i should have just tipped the six dollar winner because that's still not a bad price winner and i had and i had a wipeout too so any winner would have been good whether it was odds on or six dollars but it was just uh that I just thought this thing is just, it's just, it's overs. Yes. Um, and that's, and look, the other thing too with backing horses at overs, Kian, especially when you're backing things at big prices, and punters need to realise this as well, is that uh, you're betting, you know, the market's saying, if you're $26, the market is saying you're a 4% chance to win the race. Yeah. So 96% of the time, the horse is going to lose. Mm. So I think if you're backing those horses, you need to really be prepared for the fact that you're probably going to lose. The market's mm-hmm. saying you're probably going to lose. Mm-hmm. You're a four percent chance to win, a ninety-six percent chance to lose. So even if you're backing shorties, you're backing something at three dollars. You're only a thirty-three percent chance to win anyway. Yeah. So you're a sixty-six percent chance to lose. You're more likely going to lose yeah. when you're backing a three-dollar horse. So we touched on it way, way back in episode one or two, I think, where you just got to be prepared to have a to have a run where you're not backing winners. Yeah, it just happens. So you've well, got to... I had three value picks yesterday. Um, as I said, my value has to be over double. Has to be double yep. figures, and they all ran fourth. Well, that, so it's just the t- hopefully the the table will turn and you get a better luck. But they were all they all ran fourth. Funny thing is, what we're just talking about right now mm-hmm. is the perfect segue into our next segment on mm-hmm. this final episode, because we're hitting the big we're hitting the sixes over the fence in this episode. We're trying to. This is like the big bash. Hopefully, we're getting somewhere with it. Okay, so this is the second part that we really have to touch on, and we're just led right into it: bankroll management. Yes. Right, because there is so much punters can improve upon. Mm-hmm if they learn how to manage their punting bank better. Yeah. And I know my, many, a lot of punters don't have a punting bank as such. They just have money in their tab account mm-hmm. and they just bet off it and they don't keep records. We've suggested you should keep records and we've outlined the reasons why. Uh, and now we're going to talk about how to manage that bankroll. And anyone can do this. Anyone can do this. Uh, set up a, a bank and start to manage it. And it's something that I think if you started doing, it would improve your punting enormously. And I can't tell you how quickly it would improve your punting if you started doing this because we discussed it earlier in one of the early episodes. Your ability with your best bets, your value bets, when you single out one or two a meeting, the strike rate's huge. And obviously the prof- the, the potential for profit is there. Uh, and then it's just a matter of how you, how you manage that bankroll to, to capitalise on that, right? So how are we benefiting? How we benefit? Well, the biggest benefit from it is benefiting. It's well, it it stops the number one thing, the number one trap every punter falls into, and it's we're here to promote responsible gambling, right? Yep. That's the number one thing, and it don't chase losses. Mm. Right? It's the worst thing any punter can do is chase losses, uh, and a lot of punters do it, and they get themselves in trouble doing it, and it's a trap because 
you find yourself losing on a day or a week or a month and you think you want to turn around and get it back as quickly as you can. So what do you do? You start to increase your bet size. You start to bet more places. Mm -hmm. uh, and whilst every now and again it probably works, yep. uh, over, over time it's not going to work no. uh, and you are going to end up losing more than you want to or you should and that's not responsible gambling. So we need to try and turn that around and this whole podcast is designed to help people do that. So a bankroll management is so simple to start off with, right? If you're an average punter and you bet you're $50 a week or $100 a week and that's what you love to do and you just have fun doing it, keep doing it. If you started doing it, for example, and I'll use you as the example, when you went to your next meeting at the sunny coast and you had two best bets and a value bet, you might, for example, put 1% of your bank on each of the two best bets and maybe half a percent of your bank on your value bet. Yeah. Right, And you just go along with that for the next six months yeah. and see how you go. Yeah. Because what it's going to do is for a $500 bank, you're putting 1%, well, it's only $5, but you're putting that on each of your two best bets. So there's $10 and you're putting $2.50 on your best value bet. You're betting $12.50 of the meeting of your 500 and then you go home and record how you went. Yeah. Simple, yeah. right? And you do that week after week, meeting after meeting for six months and just see how you go. And that's pretty much how a bankroll management works. Um, I would suggest anyone starting out to use that 1% figure. Uh, it's, it's an easy way to get into it. You can't get yourself in too much trouble financially. And you'll soon see the enjoyment you get if things start to go well. And if things aren't going well and you miss a few photos, you're back a few losers, you'll find that you're really man managing those losses pretty quickly because um, you're not betting huge and you're not chasing your losses. You yeah. know, you're still only betting 1% every time you have a bet. Touched on how important it is to track your bets. Well, this is the best way to do it because yeah. you've got to go home after each meeting and write down... I had two best bets and a value bet. One of them won, the other two lost, and I made $7. Yeah. Right? And then the next meeting, the next meeting, next meeting, until you've done it for long enough that you can see where the bank's gone up or down. Uh, you've managed it successfully. You haven't got yourself in any trouble. And, uh, you know, then, then partners can have a look at if it's working well, what can I do to capitalise on that? What am I doing right? I'm going to keep doing that. What am I doing wrong? I'm going to stop doing that. Yeah. Um, so that's how bank roll management works. Me personally, I just like to bet one horse a race 95% of the time. I very rarely back two horses in a race. I do do it sometimes. A lot of other serious professional punters would probably bet four horses a race, three horses a race. They like to really flatten that variance of bad luck. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I'm happy to ride the variance of bad luck. If yeah. I have a bad luck run for a while, the fact that I'm betting such a small percentage of my bank is going to get me through that. And then when I have a bit of luck or, or things go right, you're going to capitalise on that, you yeah. know. And the other beauty of keeping it to a very small percentage of your bank, like 1% or 2%, is that when you are winning and you're having a good run, your bets are going to gradually increase mm -hmm. because you've got more in your bank. But when you're having a bad run and you're losing, your bets are going to decrease. Yeah. So instead of chasing losses, you're actually betting smaller when yeah. things are going badly. So that is the crux of bankroll management. You could talk about it for weeks or days on end, uh, but I think it's something most punters should at least consider doing mm. or giving it a try and seeing how they go with it. Mm. You happy with that? Yeah, wait till we get to the Sunshine Coast or wherever we're working next. And You're going to start? I'll tell you about my new bankroll management system I oh, have in place. I would love to hear about <laughs> that. All right, so that we'll, we'll leave it there. I think uh, we've given a good insight into how it works. And maybe, maybe we can track it over time with um, episodes to come and, and see where I land. That would be riveting content <laughs> i would love to see that i'd, I'd even like to film you because people that? haven't seen kian in a close finish no right when she's in a close finish my god it's something to behold isn't it like oh. she's on her feet she's jumping she's screaming uh, and when photos go her way you've never seen a happier person in the world when those photos go the wrong way oh, there's lucky there's a mute on the microphones <laughs> And I don't know why, but I have to get like this far away from the screen. It doesn't change the photo, does it? No. Like, oh, you're dead set, put your face on the screen thinking it may change the photo. And I'm, I'm physically riding, the, like there's so much going on to, to me thinking I'm promoting the horse forward. That's but. right. That's the other thing I didn't mention is, is your riding technique in, yeah. a close, in a driving finish. Yeah. I think you've got some of their jockeys covered in times. So oh, know. I'm... Um... I, think, I think one of the stewards came out one day, didn't he, and called you in for <laughs> whip abuse. <laughs> Only they had so many excessive, strikes, Kia. Excessive, excessive use. use. <laughs> uh, anyway. Now we're going to have a quick uh, segment, which we've hopefully proved popular mm. uh, through the last few episodes. And I think paramount, paramount, paramount to betting well. What is? 
Are you talking about gear changes? We are. We're talking yeah. about ch- changing gears. <laughs> yeah. And that's, I know it's one of the key things you look for. Mm. So we've rounded off three key gear changes in the first three episodes. Mm-hmm. Today, many one your, people... One of your favourites. Many, many, <laughs> many, many people refer to this as... Many people. <laughs> refer to this as the ultimate gear change, Kian. And I think any guy listening to this podcast... Where are the Memi people? <laughs> I'm not, we're moving on from Memi. We're on to Betty. I, I sometimes struggle. I don't struggle with the word, but sometimes I will mispronounce a it's word. It's the when best I'm, when you do. Yeah, it's it doesn't happen gold. often, does it? And oh. you, you just capitalise on like it for cap- like yeah. the next month. It, it gets me by. <laughs> I'm glad my shortcomings keep you happy in life. Changing gears. As you said. The it, ultimate the gear ultimate change. The ultimate gear change. And, and it is. It is. You, what is it? It is gelding. It's gelding, right? It's the ultimate gear change. You see it in the form guide whenever you see it you can't help but delve into that horse's form and say, is this going to be the magic cure for this horse? Is this mm-hmm. going to turn this horse around? Is he going to come out and be six lengths better than he was when he was a colt? Mm. And, of course, you've got the floor. I mean, you've described gelding. What is it to those that don't know? How does it affect a horse? This is this is right in your wheelhouse. Yes, yeah, so essentially um, when a horse is castrated, you told me not to touch on this too much, but it's, it's quite obvious um, just like a dog or a cat getting de-sexed, a little bit, a little bit different. Um, but key, I guess, advantages of it is it reduces physical heaviness up front, which offsets soundness issues with horses. They're more agile. Um, geldings require less rest, less feed than stallions do. Um, mannerisms, demeanors. Some gelding, some stallions are, r- are really bullish, and they can hurt themselves, hurt strappers, and of course they're trying to. Um, get near the female horses too so they can be quite a you know they're, they're quite a handful the other the flip side of it is everyone's after that good cold that could go on to be a stallion um i was lucky enough to to ride one track work and, and travel with with him and that was spirit of boom however he did not know he was a stallion he knows now since he served mares don't get me wrong um but he was he, you could you could put him you could ride him out with a mare and things like that. So his demeanour um, was very manageable, and so it was, it was his pedigree was great. So it was it was within reach to keep him a stallion. But it's not it doesn't work with others. You've also got things like um, it's not it's not I don't know if it's like scientifically proven, but um, sometimes you can a, a rider will say that the horse felt like dis, like a bit of discomfort. So as yep. if they're, they're something's pitching. Yep. Um, down below so there's there's a lot of reasons um, to gild a horse and and I'm a big fan of it um, I don't think there's too much reason to keep them a stallion if, if there's no need but again it's it, there's that small percentage that that colt might have some x-factor and go on to be a stallion which is ultimately what you're after yeah I think um, the point you made off air too was that you can't ungeld them that so it, once, it is, once it's done it's, it's done. not like a vasectomy mm. With, yep. I'm sure humans can have it reversed, as far as I know. Um, Apparently, it's very painful to get reversed, but it can be reversed. I wouldn't know. No, you wouldn't know. So, and, a lot and, of men out there would know. And that's the thing. You, you're weighing it up. This horse has this fantastic pedigree, um, but this is going to be something that we can't change once it's done. And I suppose uh, to try and quantify it, it's impossible, right? So a horse that's gone out of cult, come back two months, three months. We saw one the other day come back about four weeks later mm-hmm. as a gelding. Uh it is the ultimate gear change because it can turn a horse around so much. I mean, Kingston Town was yeah. our prime example, right? Going back a long, long time. Uh, as a colt, wasn't much good at all. Yeah. As a gelding, became the best horse in Australasia by a long, long way and has gone down in folklore. And obviously his mind was not on the job at hand. And that's it. Whilst he had those two things between his legs. So quantifying how much a gelding will assist a horse is impossible, we all agree on, but it is something you must look at. Yeah. It is a key gear change. Yeah. It can completely turn a horse around, and as you've touched on, it's mainly due to its its characteristics, its mentality, where its focus needs to be. Mm. Its focus needs to be on racing and not on the fillies. We'll see horses sometimes too, and it's so obvious in the run. They're just they're just foxing, is what I'd say. They're foxing, and and they they they're getting to the furlong or the two hundred one meters, <laughs> and, and they have. A jockey has a lap full, and next minute they want to lay all over the horse next to them, or you know they they just their mind is not where it should be, and we will say 
whether they're at the end of that preparation or, or something like that, you'll just say, I won't see him again until he's a gelding. And, and usually that's that's how it goes and, and you get a different horse when they come back. But there's there's different myths around it, or not myths, but I guess theories, uh, even with their growth. So I know some trainers or owners like to keep horses stallions in terms of growth, but then there's um, also a theory that, well, if they're gelded earlier, um, their, their bone structure doesn't fuse as quicker so you can have a bigger horse in the end if you geld them earlier so and obviously stallions they've got fat deposits in the crest of their neck so they're more agile as geldings and yeah you could it's another thing you could talk about all day i think it's again it's the individual horse and and that's that's what you've got to go off terrific Kian. great insight there to uh gelding and uh, you kept it pretty much <laughs> g yeah which was surprising but pleasantly surprising well done Now we're getting on to, uh, I think, everyone's favourite segment, from what I'm hearing, the feedback we're getting, all right? It's, it's, it's the Keanism. For a horse deb debutuing. <laughs> At least tongue... <laughs> I need a tongue tie. <laughs> so we're getting on to the last one for this series, but don't worry, folks, there's that many that we can cover this time and time again. So we're going to have a look now at the Keanism. And as we said, there's language in racing, but Kian has her own language. And uh, I'd heard before when I'd done previews with people this is a good thing, mm -hmm. uh, this is a certainty, there's no way this can get beat. Click and collect. Click and collect, this is a moral. But one day I was with you and you just flipped it a little bit past moral. And the word that came out of your mouth, mouth was morale. Morale. So just take us through it, what is, what is I a think morale? I think we're at Bow Desert and I said, oh, it, was, it wasn't even a horse that was racing, it got scratched because something and I said, oh yeah. I said it was a morale too. And, he obviously looked at me sideways and said, what does that mean? I said, a fancy word for moral. <laughs> well, I mean, that's simply what it is, right? Yeah. So that's the Keanism of this week. Most people say moral, you say morale. And is there any particular reason? Is it, is it Italian, French? Oh. I mean, I know how linguistic you are with, <laughs> with foreign languages. So I have no idea. It could it actually have a complete different meaning, like in real life. I'll have to ask Siri later, but <laughs> for mine... But, but for you, a morale is just a moral. It's a certainty. It's a good thing. It's a click and collect. Click and collect. Right, Put okay. in, take out. All right, so that's Kian's moral. Now, I mean, we're going with this one. It's a simple, quick one to finish off. Mm -hmm. A term that we hear often in, in, in racing, particularly by race callers, is a horse knuckles down. Mm. Uh, obviously, they're not dragging their knuckles on the ground. <laughs> I was going right? to say, so I'm, I'm putting my hat on of someone yeah. who doesn't know anything about racing. Yeah. They'd be like... Hot. Yeah, Knuckle so I mean, we, we, you've covered a lot of these. Green green was great. A lot of people hear a horse race greenly. You've covered what that means. When a horse knuckles down, what does it actually mean here? It means they flatten out, they are fully extending, they are attacking the line as in they are, uh, you know, focused on improving, promoting themselves towards the line, um, ears pinned back sort of, sort of areas. Perfect. That's what knuckling down is. And we're going to have a look at more of these, I'm sure, in... Uh, in the series that hopefully come to fruition in 2024, if we get the green light to have another crack at this, Kian. Yeah. But hopefully punters have enjoyed it and learned a bit, not mm. only about your own language, but obviously about the language of horse racing. <laughs> We're nearly finished for this episode, uh, our final episode of the series. We're just going to touch on Let's Get Topical, mm -hmm. which is where we discuss something that's happening at the moment or about to happen. And this podcast will drop in time for what we're about to discuss yes. because uh, probably couple of massive racing carnivals hit Queensland every year and I don't think many of them are any bigger than the Magic Millions mm. Carnival which of course strikes in January and January 2024 we'll see the Magic Millions Carnival on the Gold Coast on a brand new turf circuit. Mm, how exciting. And obviously it is a massive two weeks of racing, uh, Magic Millions Day of course and the Tab Wave yeah. leading up to Magic Millions Day. So we're just going to touch quickly on it Keanu, I know it's a day that we both love we're passionate about it we're both going to be involved in it this year uh so the concept of the magic millions from where it started to where it is at today just give us your thoughts quickly on that i just i just think it's amazing how it's grown it's just gone up and up and up and for mine too it is just the the cult following of the magic millions it is just such a popular race day everybody loves it and and it's not the diehard racing fans I have people, my friends messaging me, and it's just and who don't know racing from a bar of soap, but they just 
want to get to the Magic Millions, and, and I think that's pretty special. They do, and it's got that holiday vibe. It's so unique uh, to be racing it's that close. the glitter strip. That close to the beach and the Gold the Coast. Sales. And uh, it's summertime, and yeah. it's just post-Christmas, and it's early in the new year, and everyone's got that festive and sort of next, feel. And I like the I like the idea. Obviously, the sales complex is very close geographically to the racetrack, and your next year's superstars... For your two-year-olds. That's they're, right. They're all in there. They are. 12 months Some away. Way. 12 months away from being on the track as the mm. superstar or as the star uh, in 12 months' time. From a punning point of view, which is what we're all about here, uh, we heard it with Mitch earlier. Uh, Magic Millions Day is such a popular betting program mm-hmm. because they do have a lot of set weights races. Mm. And we've touched on why set weights are so popular with me personally. It's one of my favourite betting races you are getting the best horses with a weighted advantage over horses they would usually be giving weight to under handicap conditions. Not in all races, of course, on Magic Millions Day, but a lot of them are set weights races, which obviously is, is, is terrific from a punting viewpoint. Yeah, it is. And, and, and as you said, with your ratings, you can really hone in on your ratings and see horses that are rated really well and getting some sort of weight relief. Apart from punters that uh, froth over Magic Millions Day, also the trainers, they set the horses for this so far out, almost from the day they buy them from the mm-hmm. sales. Tony Gollan took it out last year with Skirt the Law, so it was a local result. We were stoked for Tony, stoked for the owners, and uh, of course it was a Queensland sire that and sired it was, Skirt the Law. It was one of the new initiatives, it was a ladies owned horse. That's it. So bonuses galore there for mm-hmm. the lady, all ladies all owned ladies horses. Owned, yeah. So uh, that was Skirt the Law last year. Tab market's already up for this year's two and three year old Magic Millions races. Uh, and, of course, that will take place in early January, Kian. So that is what we touched on today for Let's Get Topical. Let's pump up that Magic Millions. Let's get out there and enjoy it. How good. I cannot wait for the Magic Millions, Joycey. I am absolutely frothing. Uh, how about yourself? Yep, can't wait for it either, and uh, looking forward to that in the new year, of course. And you know what, Kian? That takes us away from our final episode wow. in Series 1 of Horse Racing 101. How good. So I just want to thank a few people because we've got to the end, all right? <laughs> I'd like to thank Bob Joyce. First of all, I'd, first of all, I'd actually like to thank you for coming along for the ride. Thanks. Uh, seeing the vision that we had and, and following it through to the mm. end. Let's hopefully it's as well received as we've enjoyed putting it together. Uh, obviously, thank our listeners and viewers who have tuned in to all four episodes. Yeah. If you haven't seen all four of them, go back and watch the first couple because it does set the foundation for what we just attempted to do in episode four. Mm-hmm. Hopefully, we got close. Uh, obviously thank Tab for helping us make it all happen we need their support without them we wouldn't be here and uh, we look forward to another series in 2024 Uh, so keep your eyes out for also a bonus episode or two uh, around Magic Millions time we may be able to squeeze that out and drop it in time for the Magic Millions we're hoping we can Uh, and of course uh, that will see us out for series one so thank you everybody and uh, hopefully we'll see you again for series two You win some, you lose more. For free and confidential support, call the number on the screen or visit the website.